Welcome to today's table class. My name is Tim Oust. Today we'll be concluding our study of 1 Peter chapter 5. If you've been with us through this study, you probably know that Peter wrote this epistle to believers living in Asia Minor, which is now modern-day Turkey, encouraging them to remain faithful even during times of suffering, suffering for being a Christ follower, Suffer, suffering from personal loss, suffering from physical and emotional pain, the suffering that goes along with being a church leader, all types of suffering. We are called to remain faithful and rejoice throughout all types of suffering. How is that possible? How do we do this? I started our class today with a video clip of Matt Redmond singing Blessed Be Your Name. I've sung this song many times, but honestly never contemplated its real meaning, the, the true implications of the cup it's asking us to drink from. Now, I'm going to play a little more from the uh, song, and I just ask that you listen to what the words are, are saying. Blessed be your name, on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. And then the song, it continues with, you give and take away. You give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Lord, blessed be your name. These words are a direct quote from the book of Job. If you recall the story, Job, considered a righteous man, had everything he owned taken away by enemies and destroyed by fire. And every single one of his children were killed. And in his mourning, he spoke these words. Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How can this be? In the midst of the greatest suffering and pain possible, losing your children, how is he able to respond, blessed be the name of the Lord? In the mid-1800s, prominent Chicago lawyer Horatio Spafford, a, a devout Christian who made it a practice of immersing himself in Scripture, lost his only son. And not long after that, the Chicago fire destroyed nearly every real estate investment that Horatio owned. Just a few years later, he decided to treat his wife and daughters to a much-needed escape from all the turmoil. So he sent them on a boat trip to Europe with plans to join them shortly after he wrapped up some business in Chicago. Just a few days later, he, he received a dreadful telegram from his wife, saved alone. 
It bore the excruciating news that the ship that they were on had wrecked and all four of his daughters had perished. Horatio was on his way to meet his heartbroken wife, passing over the very same sea that had just claimed the lives of his remaining children. It was then that his pen was put to paper and he wrote the words to a wonderful hymn. It is well with my soul. How, how could he possibly say this in the midst of such extreme suffering and grief? And for all of us today who suffer loss, who lose loved ones, how, how is it possible to rejoice in our grief, in our pain, in our suffering? You know, we're living in perilous times. We're in the midst of a worldwide pandemic, and it's affecting so many aspects of our lives. Friends, acquaintances, and loved ones, they're getting sick and some are dying. Many have been isolated to either at home or worse yet, in a hospital room. Visitations are severely restricted. School's been disrupted for every age group. We can't meet together to worship as a complete congregation. It doesn't feel safe to fly. My, my wife and I, we weren't able to go to our granddaughter's first birthday in Illinois. And then there's been losses due to wildfires and, and there've been riots and racial tensions. And it, it's so easy to start thinking and worrying about what kind of world are our kids and grandkids gonna grow up in? So many uncertainties about what the future holds. And honestly, these fears, they're not irrational. Not at all. These are scary times. These are uncertain times. And it's so easy to get impatient and short-tempered with others, especially those closest to us. So in the midst of all this, how do we do good and not fear anything that is frightening? Our current situation has also brought a lot of challenges to our church leaders, both our ruling elders and our teaching elders, our pastors. It's been such a stressful time for them with many working twice as hard just to keep up with all the scheduling and technological, technological changes that had moved to the forefront. They're being asked to make many important decisions during a time where change seems to happen continually. So they're prayer, prayerfully asking for God's will, guidance, and direction. How are they supposed to lead during this time? Well, certainly not by following the world's view of leadership, one-upmanship, returning insult for insult and, and power grabs? No, not at all. Instead, they're called to practice sacrificial, joyful, humble leadership. How do they possibly demonstrate this type of leadership? What motivates our church leaders to demonstrate sacrificial, joyful, humble leadership? And following their lead, how do we as members of the church body likewise demonstrate humility towards others? Now, in addition to suffering that comes from personal loss and sacrificial leadership, what about suffering that occurs as a result of being a follower of Jesus? Although we Americans don't experience a lot of overt persecution because of our faith, that doesn't mean it won't happen in the future. And quite honestly, the majority of Christians living in the world today face persecution for being Christ followers. A real-life example of one who has suffered for their faith is the pastor in our very own denomination, the EPC. His, his name is Andrew Brunson. And Pastor Brunson spent two years in prison in Turkey because he was a Christ follower. Now remember, he was in prison in the very same part of the world that Peter was writing this epistle to. Let's listen as Pastor Brunson describes his ordeal. We were arrested to be deported, then somebody uh, decided to hold us, and I think that was to intimidate other missionaries so they would self-deport. Uh, at some point I became obviously a uh, use for leverage to try to gain concessions from the U.S. There's a human story and the God story. 
what Erdogan was doing. I was his hostage, but when God had completed what he wanted to through my, my imprisonment, then he caused my release. The first night you describe, and you write this, being locked up behind a big metal door in a foreign country, hearing the keys turn and the bolts slam for the first time is sobering. It's a sudden loss of control and plunge into uncertainty. Can you describe what that felt like? A total loss of control. That was very scary. So I was saying, God, you're the one keeping me here when I have, uh, I'm desperate to get out, I'm full of fear, and you're the one who could release me and you're not doing it, and you're doing this to toughen me up. And uh, so I was having, it was taking me into a crisis of faith. Do you think you lost your faith? No, I didn't lose my faith. I was actually desperate to hold on to it. I wasn't wanting to walk away from it, but I was afraid uh, that I was going insane at times. Did you feel forsaken? At times I did, and I, I was very surprised. Um, many of the biographies I've read of who I would call Christian heroes, my heroes, uh, they show very strong people. And I expected that when I was suffering, I would also have that strength. And instead I felt very broken and weak. And you write very honestly about not only your crisis of faith, but your crisis of depression. How deep was your despair at one point? At one point, the Turkish government uh, wanted to give me three life sentences in solitary confinement with no parole. So I thought this, I could waste away here and spend years in this terrible isolation. And I'd much rather be in heaven than spend the rest of my life in a Turkish prison. And that's what was leading me toward think of suicide. I'm glad I didn't do it. The combination of despair and anxiety is very dangerous. So when I think I may not ever get out, I just wanted to escape the situation. It's not that I wanted to die. It's that I didn't want to live. I couldn't imagine living in these circumstances for a long period of time. Dr. Brunson was left completely isolated and intimidated. And although his faith was growing, he experienced severe depression and anxiety. He faced the real possibility of spending the rest of his life in complete isolation. Most certainly the natural response, the human response to such injustice and persecution would be to have vengeance and hatred towards those responsible. But that wasn't Dr. Brunson's response. During the trial, when you had to defend yourself, you describe how you found your voice. Can you describe that and, and what that trial was like? I chose to forgive people, which I have to forgive them anyway because that's what I'm required to do as a Christian. Actually, Jesus said that we're supposed to rejoice when we're persecuted uh, for his sake. So I said, I, I'm blessed to actually be suffering for his sake. And that's when I felt, I felt almost a holy defiance, I would say. We didn't know when we went to the final court session, it ended up being the final court session, I didn't know that I would be released. I packed two bags, one to go to, come to the States and the other to return to prison. So in the court session, they declared me guilty of terrorism. But then they said, we're suspending this you know, for time served and while you uh, appeal it and your travel ban is, list, is lifted. And that basically means, please leave as soon as you can. <laughs> so it was such a roller coaster to go from being convicted of terror, thinking I'm going back to prison, and then we're rushing to the airport to get on an Air Force plane and leave Turkish airspace as soon as possible in case they change their mind. By the world standards, Pastor Brunson had every right to hate those who were responsible for persecuting him. But rather than hate them, he chose to forgive them. How? How is that possible? When we face wrongdoing and persecution, how do we willingly suffer wrong and serve rather than return evil for evil? All of these questions are asked and answered in 1 Peter. So in our concluding class on 1 Peter today, we'll be revisiting these questions and, and learning that the answer to them is all part of the divine encouragement that we receive from the Holy Spirit as we walk this life in the hope and anticipation of the future glory that's promised to all who believe. So let's begin by listening to today's passage followed by prayer. 
So I exhort the elders among you, as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him, because He cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. May God bless the reading of his word. Would you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you for your spirit who is with us, who's around us, and who's in us and provides us with the strength to remain faithful during all trials and times of suffering and persecution. And not only to remain faithful in such times, but to actually experience and express overflowing joy, knowing that Jesus suffers right along with us. Father, in all times, times when you give and times when you take away, may we hold tight to our living hope, hope in our resurrected Savior, and the promise of our resurrection when he comes back again, and hope in our future glory, making our present suffering seem like just a little while. O oh Lord, let the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We ask this in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So how does Peter answer these questions? Well, we'll be addressing each one of them individually. And we'll discover that the how in every one of these questions can be answered with the word hope. The answer to these calls to respond in a counter-cultural manner. A manner, a manner that's counterintuitive, that, that doesn't make sense by this world's standard. Is by having an unshakable, all-satisfying hope beyond this life. As John Piper writes, woven through the entire letter of 1 Peter is the repeated call for a condition of heart, a way of life that only makes sense if we're absolutely sure that we have a great reward in heaven. Peter calls us again and again to think and feel and act in a way that can only be explained by an unshakable, all-satisfying hope beyond this life. He goes on to write, and of course I don't mean the hope of material wealth or pain-free health or reunion with loved ones or perfect leisure or futility-free productivity in the age to come. All that is true, but not central or primary. The ultimate reward that makes sense of the life Peter calls us to live is the reward of being with God, enjoying his beauty. In 1 Peter 3.18, Peter says, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. That he might bring us to God. That's why Jesus died for us, that
that he might bring us to God. Not for our punishment, but for our pleasure. As Psalm 1611 says, In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's what Jesus died for. That's our final reward. That's our ultimate hope. All else is overflow and secondary. In 1 Peter 1, 6, Peter calls us to rejoice in suffering, writing, in, in this you greatly rejoice, so now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. Rejoice in suffering? What possibly makes sense of that? How is it possible to rejoice in suffering? Hope beyond this life, that's how. Just look at the next verse. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Do you see it? He speaks of the incomparable reward of glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We look forward to the return of Jesus when we will receive the incomparable reward of glory and honor. In 1 Peter 3, 6, Peter tells Christian wives who are married to non-believing husbands to do good and not fear anything that's frightening. Now, even though this is specifically addressed to Christian wives married to non-believing spouses, it certainly flows in line with a pattern of Christian behavior that applies to all of us, a pattern that Peter has been repeating throughout this epistle. Do good and do not fear anything. Do good and do not fear anything? Really? With everything that's going on right now, do good and do not fear anything that's frightening. How do we possibly do that? How do we do good and not fear anything that's frightening? Well, Peter answers this question in the previous verse. He says, this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves. The Christ-exalting fearlessness of a Christian woman and man can only be explained by hope that goes beyond this world. Hope in God. In 1 Peter 3, 9, Peter commands us, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. Do not repay evil for evil, instead bless. How? When we face wrongdoing and persecution, how do we willingly suffer wrong and serve rather than return evil for evil? Andrew Brunson was locked in a cold cell in isolation, separated from his family, separated from his church family, falsely accused, resulting in horrible depression. He had every reason to hate his enemies, but instead he forgave them. How did he do this? Peter answers in the same verse, because to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. Returning good for evil when it may cost us our lives in this world is possible because we put our hope in a blessing beyond this world. That's why in 1 Peter 4.13, Peter calls for the counterintuitive behavior. Rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, so that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. So again, as John Piper said so well, woven through this entire letter is Peter's repeated call to think and feel and act in a way that can only be explained by an unshakable, all-satisfying hope beyond this life. The hope of being with God, of seeing and sharing his glory. And what is that peculiar way of thinking and feeling and acting that only makes sense in the light of hope beyond the grave? It's a joyful, humble willingness to suffer wrong and serve rather than return evil for evil. First Peter 2.20 says, What credit is it when you sin and are beaten for it? You endure but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, that's a gracious thing in the sight of God. 1 Peter 3.14 says, even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. 1 Peter 3.17 says, it's better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. 1 Peter 4.1, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourself with the same way of thinking. And 1 Peter 14, 4, 19 says, Let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. This is a strange, counterintuitive way of life that Peter calls for. 
a joyful, humble willingness to suffer wrong and serve rather than return evil for evil. And then another name for this is love. So when we come to our final chapter in 1 Peter, this otherworldly mindset and this otherworldly hope are woven through Peter's final thoughts. In verse 1, Peter presents himself not as an apostle as in the first chapter, but a fellow elder alongside the elders in the churches. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. This is a humble thing to do. He's modeling the humility and joyful readiness to serve that he's about to call for. It's rooted in the fact that he is seeing Christ suffer and serve like this, and he is expected that he's going to share in the coming glory. Verse 1b, I exhort you as a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that's going to be revealed. Then he calls for that same kind of service from the elders in verse 2 and 3. Verse 2a, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you. Verse 2b, not for shameful gain, but eagerly. Verse 3, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. How does this make sense in a world where the very step of leadership is coercion and money and power? What motivates our church leaders to demonstrate sacrificial, joyful, humble leadership? Answer, verse 4. When the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory, having hope beyond this life. That's why this makes sense. This way of sacrificial, joyful, humble leadership makes sense because of the hope of glory at the coming of Christ. You will receive the unfading crown of glory. The life of true biblical eldership only makes sense in the light of eternity. And then in verses 5 to 7, Peter takes that same mindset and he applies it to all of us. You see that in the word likewise at the beginning of verse 5. Likewise. That is, just as the elders are called to be humbled and serve you as examples rather than lording it over you, so you who are younger be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. How can that make sense in a world where humility and lowliness and servanthood don't get you a political nomination and don't get you a job? A world where self-promotion and self-exaltation are woven into the very fabric of the culture. How does demonstrating humility towards others make any sense at all? Answer, verse 5b. It makes sense because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Well, what grace? Don't we already have grace? Well, yes, we do. But there's a future grace, more grace, that's coming to believers who clothe themselves with humility towards each other. And what is that? Verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. This is why this is not of this world, humble, self effacing attitude that's willing to suffer and serve rather than return evil for evil makes sense. It makes sense because as we see in Matthew 13, 43, just over the horizon of this world, all the lowly nobodies who suffered in obedience to Christ will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. Think of it. There are hundreds of thousands of faithful Christians around the world in very difficult circumstances, and only a handful of people even know they exist while they joyfully endure the hardships of following Christ. As John Piper writes about this, there's going to be a great reversal. It's only a matter of time. Followers of Jesus do not need the reward of this world. We don't need to be treated well. We don't need to prosper. Like those elders in verses 2 and 3, we don't need to be coerced in order to serve gladly. We don't need riches to be happy. We don't need power in order to feel a sense of significance because we've set our hope not on the exaltation of this world, but on the exaltation and glory of the next. And there's no comparison. David Pack, in one of his recent daily devotionals, spoke of this hope when he was citing from David Platt's book, Radical. Let me show you. 
to this. Like the key is realizing and believing that this world is not our, our home. And if you and I ever hope to be free to um, live lives that are free from worldly dreams, worldly ideals, worldly values, worldly ambitions, and worldly actions, then we have to focus on another world. Right? If our lives um, are going to count on earth, we must start by concentrating on heaven. For then and only then will you and I be free to live for radical risk, knowing that what awaits us is radical reward. On to verses 8 through 10. Here Peter tells us how to deal with the roaring lion of the devil who wants to devour us. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. It's interesting that the devil is not pictured as a serpent here, but as a roaring lion. Why roaring? Well, lions roar when they're hungry and angry. This devil is not trying to sneak up on you. He's trying to terrify you, make you afraid, fill you with anxieties, keep you off balance and nervous. So how does this roaring lion devour people? Verse 9b explains, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by our brotherhood throughout the world. This lion is roaring and biting and clawing by causing people, Christians in particular, to suffer. His aim is to destroy Christians through suffering. He aims to make us doubt the goodness of God or, or the presence of God or the power of God or that God even cares. This is how the horrible roar works, the claws, the teeth. When in prison, Pastor Andrew Brunson was experiencing the lion's roar, his sinking teeth. And Peter tells us, verse 9a, resist him firm in your faith. John Piper writes about this. Does this mean that if you're successful, the claws never cut? The teeth never sink in? No. It means that when the claws cut and when the teeth sink in, don't stop believing. Don't stop being humble. Don't stop returning good for evil. Don't stop rejoicing. Don't stop loving. That is successful resistance to the roaring lion, even if it costs you your life. Really? Keep on returning good for evil? When the adversaries are agents of the devil? When they go on reviling and threatening us? Really? Keep on blessing? Keep on doing good? What could possibly make sense out of that response to the lion? Answer, verse 10. After you've suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Resist the lion with unwavering joy and humility and love. Keep on doing good to those who hate you. How? By believing verse 10 with all your heart. Keep on hoping in this, this eternal glory, this promise of total restoration and confirmation and strength everlasting, unshakable, established glory. This future beyond the suffering of this world, that's the key. And verse 11 reminds us God is in control. His is the dominion, always has been, is presently, and will be for eternity. And in verse 12, we're assured that God's grace sustains us as we stand firm in it. As theologian Bradley Bell writes, the exile, the suffering, the marginalization, the refining, the waiting, the longing, the abstaining, the submitting, the enduring, the humbling, this way of life is the way of grace. And only Christ on a cross can make sense of that for you. And along with sustaining grace that God provides, verse 14, is everlasting peace. Peter sent this epistle from Rome. Babylon was likely a reference to Rome, a city that in that day was the epicenter of opposition to the gospel of Jesus Christ. She who was at Babylon, it probably means the Christian church in Rome. As theologian Wayne Grudem writes, what more of a picture of the peace of Christ than Peter sending a blessing of peace from, of all places, Rome? 
What a reminder that our goal as Christians isn't a peaceful life. It's a peaceful soul in the midst of a crazy life. And that's what Peter's extending here on behalf of Jesus. Greet one another with the affection and peace of knowing you are in Christ, sustained by the hope of glory. And as we come to the closing of both this class and our series on 1 Peter, please allow these words from Pastor John Piper to fill you with sustaining hope during these unsettling times. So I say again, woven through this entire letter of 1 Peter, including chapter 5, is the call for a condition of heart and a way of life that only makes sense if we're absolutely sure we will have a great reward in heaven. That condition of heart and way of life is a joyful, humble willingness to suffer wrong and serve rather than return evil for evil. All that reward in heaven is a crown of glory and exaltation in the presence of the all-satisfying God. All wrongs against set right. All patience under mockery vindicated. All shame in this world taken away and replaced with honor. All pain removed. All losses restored. All brokenness mended. All humiliation exchanged for garments of glory. All slander revealed to be false before the whole world. All anonymity and quiet faithfulness replaced with global fang among the millions of the redeemed. In this letter, God calls us to a kind of heart and a kind of life that makes no sense in this world. Joyful, humble willingness to suffer wrong and serve rather than return evil for evil. It only makes sense if we're sustained by the hope of glory. Thank you so much for joining us. To God be the glory now and forevermore. Amen.